And uh, with that, uh, Professor Stone, uh, stage is yours. Um, thank you. Uh, everyone can hear me? Well, I'll assume that everyone can hear me. So first of all, um, uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak with you. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, and uh, I, I'm actually wearing a jacket in my office because my office is very cold this morning. But I hope you have a wonderful meeting, and I was actually able to hear some of the talks, um, so that was really um, special for me, so thank you. I hope another time we'll uh, meet in person. So I have uh, you know 15 or 20 minutes, so I thought I'd just give you a survey of a few things. Uh, involving physical chemistry and fluid mechanics. The topic relates to how chemical gradients uh, affect uh, materials. Uh, you might have been in introduced to that when you think about equilibrium systems. I will tell you about non-equilibrium systems, and that term is referred to as uh, diffusiophoresis, and it's been uh, work I've collaborated on with many people. And then I'll just show you a few examples including flow and porous media, how you might separate particles, the effect of the choice of the electrolyte. And very recently, we've been trying to see where these ideas of colloid science uh, may influence biological systems. Uh, I won't have time to talk about that, but I'd be happy to talk offline. So if you um, go into this field and, and want to understand how physical chemistry intersects with fluid mechanics, you'll find it in many places. So uh, in, in some areas of biology, you use electric fields to separate macromolecules. That's called electrophoresis, usually. If you talk to civil engineers involved with trying to design uh, cements, the role of ions can be very important. If you think about uh, batteries or other energy storage devices, uh, the role of the ions, whether in the uh, liquid phase or the solid phase, is very important. And uh, in fluid mechanics, th this often comes up through a separations process or a phoretic process, um, but it's tied to the diffusion of ions. And so the term that was coined is diffusiophoresis. And as I just tried to highlight, this comes up many, many places. So uh, two things to keep in mind when you think about how ions affect fluids. If you've uh, ever studied osmosis, then you pick, have a picture on the left where you have uh, two aqueous solutions typically uh, with different salt concentrations on the left versus the right. And they're separated by a membrane that only allows the solvent, the water typically to pass. And what happens is uh, water moves across the membrane to equalize its chemical potential effectively to lower its energy. And so what you tend to have is water moving to uh, uh, equilibrate the system. So if you have a high concentration on one side, the water from the other side is trying to dilute it. And that's pictured on the right. And uh, that in an ideal system, the change in pressures that you uh, get, so-called osmotic pressures, are linear in concentration, C. The other effect you have is most materials in liquids have charge, and this sketch indicates that you can expect a surface charge here negative. So if there are ions in solution, the counter ions collect near the surface, uh, and, and the region where there are higher concentration is called the equilibrium double layer. And uh, if you ever study this, what you'd uh, find is that the scale indicated on the left by lambda, uh, where you have distributed charge in the liquid, where the charges are free to move, varies as uh, one upon the square root of concentration. So higher concentrations make this layer thinner. And if you study this in books, what you'll learn is that uh, you don't worry about the choice of the ion. Uh, sodium ions and potassium ions and chlorine ions, they're all the same. So you'd learn in an equilibrium picture that one-to-one -one electrolytes, all one-to-one -one electrolytes in this picture are identical. And what uh, the rest of the talk is going to show you, and we did not discover this, but we're one group that works in this area, is that when you're not in equilibrium, when you have chemical gradients, then uh, the choice of the salt can matter. So a sodium Base salt will be different than a potassium base salt. And I found that very interesting from an engineering or applications perspective, because now features of the solution matter. They're not just a viscosity or a density. 
Um, now, one way to think about this is if you had a particle, I, I saw there were many beautiful talks. I got to listen to a few in the conference on uh, particle motion at low Reynolds numbers. If you apply a force F to a particle uh, that has some surface potential, so-called zeta potential, uh, then the particle will move at speed V. And it's been known in, for a long time that uh, the velocity V is linear in the electric field. And uh, for thin double layers, that result is uh, independent of the shape of the particle, result known for a long time. And this electrophoresis result is basically at the heart of why most electrolyte systems, when there is a gradient in concentration, will cause particles to move. And the a formula that captures this idea, which is sort of an, a classic formula, uh, says that you can expect an electric field in a liquid, so that's E on the left, uh, if you have a gradient of concentration, uh, it turns out the effect goes as the gradient of the log of the concentration, and the size of the effect depends on the difference of diffusion constants of the cations D plus from the anions D minus. And so it's this idea, if I can try to capture that, that's at the heart of why chemical gradients now are important and the choice of the salt matters because that affects D plus and D minus. I give two numbers here to show that if you switch from a, a solution that's potassium chloride to one that's sodium chloride, most scientists uh, think they're more or less identical, but they have a very different uh, difference of diffusivities uh, plus to minus, and so they'll have a very different effective electric field-driven motion. Uh, a very beautiful paper, if you just wanted to pick one paper to learn a little about this, I would pick this one from Litteric Bouquet's group. It shows uh, three experiments left to right uh, and shows confocal scans along a uh, across a microfluidic channel. Uh, just uh, briefly, the, the picture on the left shows that if you have the same solution uh, entering your microfluidic channel and you put colloidal, gold colloidal particles in the middle, then uh, at the bottom, if you see my cursor, as you go downstream, the gold colloidal particles maintain the same width at every position downstream. And although they're Brownian, you don't see any effect of Brownian motion because the speed is sufficiently fast. If you do the same experiment, but you add salt to the outside channels, that's the middle one, the particles move downstream, but they spread outward. And if you add salt to the inner stream, the particles move downstream, but they move, uh, get pushed inward by uh, a, an effect. And they're moving relative to the flow because of a, a electric, effectively electrical effects. And so this is a way you can manipulate only using salt, and in particular, the choice of the salt. If you go into the details of this field and you uh, go through the different pieces of mathematics and uh, want to study this, I encourage you to read early work from John Anderson and Dennis Preeve uh, from the 1980s. They will talk about two different contributions to this effect. One is really an osmotic pressure effect. Because that's chemical, it's referred to as chemiphoresis. And uh, one is this electric field effect I told you about, so that's called electrophoresis. And they both cause motion of the sol of the fluid relative to the boundary. And so the particle has to move. And you can derive a detailed formula that takes into account all of these effects. Um, but uh, at the heart of it, there are, two, uh, there are these two effects that are traced to concentration. And you can expect particles to move. And the way all researchers or most researchers try to describe the speed of the particle relative to the fluid, what they'll call the diffusiophoretic speed, uh, written on my slide here, V sub dp, is as proportional to the gradient of the log of concentration, again, because that's what's the case for electrolytes, and the proportionality coefficient, this ddp, is a diffusion constant that's primarily associated with the ions. So this effect causes particles to move much closer to the speed of ions diffusing than the Brownian diffusivity of the particle itself. If you're interested in the history of this, where this came about, there's a very beautiful uh, paper from the 70s by Dennis Preeve, uh, or maybe yeah, early 80s, where he describes some of the early history, and he has this wonderful uh, 
note that uh, he, he refers to a very old paper from Deryagin who showed that the effect of electrolytes are the responsible for macroscopic gradients of particle motion, and it's the macroscopic gradients of the salt that are driving those particles moving. Now, uh, much more is known in detail about this. So here's some of our work. Uh, we were interested in moving particles into so-called dead-end channels. We followed on some beautiful work of uh, Daryl Veligal at Penn State. And the kind of experiment I'm gonna show you is here. I'm hoping that this the slides are showing up at your end. Uh, outlined in yellow are so-called dead-end pores. They're just fluid sitting in the pores. And there'll be a flow left to right as indicated on the top of the slide. And in the flow, we'll put particles. We're gonna put two different color particles. They're two different sizes. And when the flow goes left to right, what you observe is that uh, particles move into the channel, even though there's no net flow into the, into the side channels. And so that relative motion of particles to fluid is, is uh, we would call a diffusiophoretic motion. And in this case, we've driven that motion by having one salt concentration in the main channel, 0.02 millimolar, and a higher salt concentration in the pores. And the particles in this case move towards higher salt concentrations. There's nothing special about this arrangement. We've also done uh, the experiment another way, which is to, uh, if you look on the right, first fill the pore with particles and then try to remove the particles from the pore or manipulate the particles in the pore. And so the way that works is this experiment. Here we've now loaded the particles into the pore space. Uh, the pore space has a high salt concentration, in this case, sodium chloride at 25 millimolar. The, the main channel now is fresh fluid, but it has low salt. And a consequence of this is that the particles in the pore are compressed uh, and uh, or compacted and we can follow all these things quantitatively. Of course, what this says is that if you made the salt concentration outside the pore higher, you would tend to remove the particles from the pore. So this gives you a way to access small spaces even if the flow itself can't get in. These uh, microfluid experiments are ones that we've now done a lot of work on also trying to quantify. This geometry I find interesting in, in the sense that it's sort of a one-dimensional geometry. So it gives you a way to try to compare features of your modeling and experiments. Okay, so uh, that's just hopefully shows you the idea that you can use salt gradients, salt concentration gradients to manipulate particles. It doesn't really matter much what the pore space looks like. You can expect these effects to be um, robust and they'll be tied to the diffusion coefficients of the ions you choose. Okay, so that's the first thing I want to show you. Uh, something we stumbled on, uh, courtesy of uh, Patrick Warren, then at Unilever, was trying to think about how these ideas will affect porous media. And one application of porous media is cleaning pore space and porous media. One application, of course, is uh, clothes or other materials where you typically use detergents uh, to remove materials. Uh, for many of these porous materials, they're hierarchical in the sense that if you consider a fabric, there are many different uh, yarns that are put together. Each of the yarns is made up of multiple fibers. And so you can imagine thinking about the ideas I'm gonna show you as how you think about uh, physical chemical hydrodynamics in hierarchical porous-like materials. Uh, because they have multiple scales. A challenge is that it's easy for the fluid to get through the large pores between the yarns. It's very challenging for the fluid to get the into the small pores at the scale of individual fibers. And if you make a, a, a Brownian diffusion argument for how long it would take a one micron particle uh, to diffuse from the middle of a few fibers outside to where it might see fresh fluid, um, that estimate is on the right, on the left, and suggests that it takes a few hours for a Brownian particle to get away from the, the, the pore space in between fibers. I'm sure you realize our most cleaning processes aren't that long, so presumably something else is going on. And that's uh, the thing that we stumbled on 
is what I'll tell you next. So how is it that small uh, particles are likely removed from the pore space of this hierarchical like structure? And so we did this ex the following experiment. We took um, two cotton fabrics, uh, both with uh, small particles in them. The particles were 200 nanometer uh, polystyrene particles. Uh, we soaked them in a surfactant that's common in uh, detergency. In this case, we chose SDS. That would look like a cleaning process. And then we exposed one to uh, the same concentration of SDS being stirred very well, like you'd imagine in a uh, part of a wash cycle. And we exposed the other one to deionized water, which you'd expect it would look like if you were cleaning what you do after you apply the soap. And uh, what you'll see in the movie is that they're both in identical, otherwise identical solutions, both stirred. One has salt, uh, surfactant in it, one doesn't. And you see that the, the preparation that has a salt gradient, the one that had SDS in the fabric, but pure water outside, so there's a clear chemical gradient, that allows a significant amount of transport out of the fabric. And so the, the uh, picture of the on the right-hand side is the uh, uh, individual snapshots. And what this sort of suggests, which according to um, our colleagues, hadn't really been appreciated, is it's the gradients that you create sort of after the wash, if you like, or after you do your own kinds of cleanings, that uh, may be most responsible for removing the small particles from the small pore spaces where they're trapped. So that's a nice example, I think, of uh, fundamental ideas in practice. Uh, a lot of work in the field is on one-to-one -one electrolytes, uh, sodium chloride, potassium chloride. So we tried to do uh, controlled experiments with multivalent electrolytes, and, and we tried to make uh, detailed comparisons with experiments, with uh, modeling. Just to show you uh, the idea, we took um, a salt, uh, sodium sulfate, so that you'd call a one to two electrolyte. It's got one positive charge in sodium and two negative charges on the uh, sulfate. We, here we do these um, uh, invasion experiments where going left to right, particles move into the pore. The figure on the right by tracking the intensity I versus position into the pore shows you how particles invade the pore. We also did the same kind of experiment in so-called compaction conditions where uh, we uh, apply the salt gradient and the particles are pushed into the pore. Again, we can look at how the intensity changes with position. And then we could compare these kind of experiments with a our theory that I uh, told you that accounts for the chemical effects. And effectively, there are no fitting parameters. We, we know all the geometry and we have a good estimate of the diffusion constants from the literature. And uh, shown left to right are just some typical uh, curves. There's a blue one and a green one. The data points are the symbols and the smooth curve is the theory. Uh, they're not perfect, but they're pretty close. They all show a, a, a significant difference between a chlorine salt and a sulfate salt. And uh, so these kind of effects that you quantify, you can now trace to the different ions present in um, solution. Uh, some of you might be familiar with the Hofmeister series in physical chemistry. So we've looked once or twice to think a little about what the relation might be, but I don't feel uh, comfortable with what I understand about that. Okay, so um, finally, I think I've got a couple minutes. So in, in the last uh, couple minutes, I'll just show you the theme of a problem we looked at. I uh, like this concept of Taylor dispersion. And so we started to look at um, how these things might affect uh, the dispersion process. Uh, many of you in the audience may be familiar with dispersion. You take a channel flow. It has a velocity gradient. You watch how chemicals disperse. Uh, we're going to watch how particles uh, disperse uh, in, in these kind of uh, systems. And we did it in uh, many different uh, channels of different dimensions. If you're familiar with so-called Taylor dispersion, you know geometry has some effect. To give you the idea of what we're looking at, uh, I'll play a few movies. You'll see the particles move along the pore. And in each case, you'll see that they spread out and there's an average spreading. The speed is always a little slower at the wall than in the middle. That's a consequence of the geometry. And the three different channel heights shown on the left show you that you see a, an effect of geometry. 
and you see an effect uh, on the spreading that comes from these kind of uh, flow-driven processes or chemically-driven flow processes. And in each case, we can track this kind of um, uh, mean distribution along the channel. You see, you can track the mean position and you can track how much it spreads. Those are the two characteristic features of a dispersion process. We then made a mathematical model. The mathematical model teach, tries, tries to keep track of the speed of the fluid, which is driven by a wall effect I didn't tell you much about, which is you refer to as diffusio osmosis. We try to keep track of the speed of the particles. That's the so-called diffusio phoretic speed. We try and put it all together in the theme of what looks like a Taylor dispersion problem. Uh, the typical Taylor dispersion problem looks like an advective diffusion equation shown on the lower right, where there's an effective diffusion constant here called K and an effective uh, mean speed of the particle from the dispersion. I'll just show you the consequence of this. Uh, we have uh, an experiment at top, which is very, very long, so we can track over long distance. We can uh, average that signal and then compare with the uh, uh, num numerical solution to a PDE which is shown in black, and that comparison is shown uh, here. So we get the mean speed about right. We get the spreading about right. Um, almost everything here is uh, has no fitting parameters because it's uh, been measured independently in our experiments. Okay, so with that, I think I've reached the end. Again, I'm sorry I couldn't join you, but I've, I've tried to show you a few things to get you thinking about this intersection of physical chemistry and microfluidics, physical chemistry, and hydrodynamics. And uh, we've been, as I said, we've been trying to uh, work on this with a couple biological problems in mind to show where cellular scale problems might be influenced by this. Um, that's ongoing work. And so with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much, Professor Stone, for a fascinating talk, as always. Uh, now, time for questions. Is anyone awake? Yeah, yeah, they're oh, coming. Quest say, questions questions are coming. Talk. I guess okay. we're between dinner time and uh, uh, things, so uh, I'm oh, happy I to mean, we we are not yet. And dinner it can wait. Yeah, questions okay. are coming. So I have a question. Thank you for the talk. So you very nicely showed that within your pores you can induce dispersion and compression of the particles. So uh, I was wondering if you alternate the concentration of the ions in the channel which is flowing. Can you induce mixing in those pores as well? Using all um, I think that that's a great question. We have not done that. Um, I guess by mixing, you're saying to first put one thing in and then put something else in, something like that. Or you mean create a time varying field of some kind to try to pr promote stirring in the. Yeah, exactly. Either of them. Yeah. We haven't done that. I think uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there's something in that spirit. There, There's at least one paper, maybe from. Uh, Litterick Bouquet's group or Todd Squire's group about time dependent effects. So, I, and I think those are worth looking at. I don't think they, they do what you are asking though, but they do uh, talk about some aspects of how time variations can come in. And my recollection, I haven't thought about this in a while, is that there's a surprising feature uh, that things are less, that, that time dependent effects are less uh, significant than you might think, but I, I might be confused. It might not be relevant to your question though. Any other question? Okay, yeah, all right. So if there are no further question, thank you again, Professor Stone. And okay. um, yeah, we, we Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, to yeah we have a time. goodie bag uh, for all the invited speakers, uh, for you also, which will come to you later. Thank you.